Good morning. Oh, I love little response. That's terrific. Good. It's great to hear to have you here with us today. Um, we're delighted uh, that you can be part of what uh, we think is going to be the beginning of a great tradition for the Milken Institute. This is our very first Milken Institute Public Health Summit. We're looking forward to a very productive day, a very busy one, and one where you're going to have difficult choices about what to see and do. Our goal at the Milken Institute and our Center for Public Policy is to do in the area of public health what we've done uh, in the field of medical research, that is, spear and which has been spearheaded by our great Faster Cures uh, division, which is here uh, in Washington, D.C. We want to bring together people in the field, spark ideas and insights, help foster effective collaboration in the public health arena with the goal of making, our, making prevention at least as important and meaningful for funders, for policymakers, as discovering cures currently is. Today's sessions include panels on some of the most pressing issues in public health with insights from top experts in the field. Uh, you're going to have a wonderful day, uh, and I'm sure you'll all be here for the full day. You won't want to miss the lunch session with a special update on the Zika crisis from CDC Director Tom Frieden. Um, and tonight we have a great dinner, which if you signed up for, you'll really enjoy with uh, uh, a uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful discussions. If you haven't signed up for it, I must tell you it's full. So if you'd like to attend and hear uh, Congressman Upton and, uh, and, and uh, um, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and the director of uh, the NIH, Francis Collins, and FDA Commissioner Robert uh, Cardiff, you can do that if uh, you have either signed up already or if you want to come and sort of stand by to see if we have no show so there's room. Um, to make the day productive as possible for you, uh, be sure, if you haven't done so already, that you download the Milken Institute Events app. It's included in the full program panel um, uh, locations. It includes the speaker list. And um, importantly, it includes the biographies of all of our speakers. Uh, now, we have, as I mentioned, a number of sessions. The breakout sessions will be seated on a first-come, first-served uh, basis. So even if you signed up for something to give us an indication of who's going to what, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed a seat. Uh, so please, if it's something important to you, get there, get there on time. And if you miss a panel, don't worry. As is traditional for all of the Milken Institute events, all of the panels will be posted online very shortly, probably by this time tomorrow. Okay, uh, enough with the preliminaries. We'll tell you a little bit more about the Milken Institute at lunch. But in the meantime, let's start our opening plenary, the promise of public health. We're delighted to have as the moderator for this great panel, Richard Bressler. Richard is the uh, chief health and medical uh, editor at ABC News. He served at the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, in, including as head of the Coordinating Office for Terrorism, Preparedness, and Emergency Response. His many awards include the Surgeon General's Medallion for his leadership at the CDC during the H H1N1 pandemic, and as a Dean's Medal from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We have a wonderful panel for you, and to introduce them and to lead it, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Besser and our panel. Thanks. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here for this in inaugural Public Health Summit. Um, and to, uh, it, it's a great honor to be moderating this, this session on the promise of public health. Um, for the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to try and stimulate a, a conversation uh, among four people who, who come to public health with very different backgrounds and, I expect, very different perspectives on, on public health. Let me very briefly introduce the panel. Uh, I refer you to the app for more details on, on uh, everyone's background. Um, uh, on my left is Joe Jimenez. He is the CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals, 
which is one of the largest and most profitable drug companies in the world. Uh, under his leadership, Novartis has focused on new drug development with a particular emphasis on drugs for treating cancer. Uh, uh, next to, to Joe is Nancy Brown, who is the CEO of the American Heart Association, uh, with a mission to improve cardiovascular health for all Americans. Under her leadership, the AHA has committed to work to reduce deaths from heart disease and stroke by 20% by the year 2020. Uh, next to Nancy is Congressman Fred Upton. He represents a district in Southwest Michigan and is chair of the Committee on Energy and Commerce in the House of Representatives. Uh, he was a leader in drafting and getting through the House the bipartisan 21st Century Cures Act, which aims to accelerate biomedical research and speed the movement of drugs to the marketplace. And our last panelist is Tom Farley. He is the new health commissioner of Philadelphia and for five years served as the health commissioner in New York City. He's known for his use of innovative public health policies to improve community-wide health. Um, to begin, I want to give each of our, of our panelists a, a little chance to talk. Um, and, and when I was thinking about this panel on, on public health and promise of public health, I, I remembered a video I had seen many years ago at a public health conference. And in the video, uh, they went on the street and they, they asked the public the question, what is public health? And the answers that, that they got back were, were all over the board. Uh, people's idea of what public health is and what it could do uh, was, was very varied. And it, it struck me that we have a bit of an identity crisis when it comes to public health. Um, and as I mentioned, we have four different backgrounds here. So to start, uh, I wanted to give you each two or three minutes to say, what is public health to you? And what do you see as the big promise for public health over the next 20 years or so? Joe? Uh, let me start. I, you know, I think to me, public health means improving the health of the general public in whatever society you are, you are existing in. So for example, the role of a pharmaceutical company in, in public health would be to help uh, either prevent or eliminate disease. And when you think about the demographic changes that the world is going to see over the next 10 years, we're going to add a billion people to the population of the earth. And half of that number is going to be over the age of 55. So there's going to be increased chronic disease. And, and the, the promise of public health is that technology is advancing so fast that we're able to address disease like never before. So the role of my company in public health is, is to discover and develop new technologies, new medicines that can improve overall public health. Thanks very much. Nancy? You know, from my point of view, when I think about the definition of public health, I think about a doctor who might individually diagnose a patient. When you think about public health, whether it's a community, a state, you know, a country, or the world, thinking about diagnosing what the issues are in that particular area and how do we coalesce the resources in, for example, a community to help create an environment where people have a better chance of living a healthier life. You know, at the American Heart Association, as an example, we work very hard to make sure that we can help change the environment around people so that they have a better chance of cardiovascular health and overall health. We know that individuals um, are such an important part of the equation. Each of us as individuals have to make decisions about our commitment to health, but it's so much easier to do if we have safe places to walk, if the food supply is, is appropriate, if there's no tobacco um, you know, in the restaurants and places that we frequent. And so public health to me is the coalescence of resources in a community, a state, or a government to tackle critical health issues to make the world a better place for our people. Thanks very much. Fred? You know, I started this morning a, a breakfast with the, the Rare Disease uh, Coalition is up on Capitol Hill today. And they're making the big pitch for the bill that we passed in the House, H.R. 6, uh, 21st Century Cures. And when you look at the stats, one in 10 American families have a rare disease. 30% of those uh, folks um, don't reach the, the birthday of five. And so when you think about our country, and you know, I just look at my family, and I'm no different than any, anybody else. My dad has uh, pretty severe diabetes. Uh, that device that he's been running the last two years saved his life the first week he had it. My mom's a cancer survivor. 
My wife's got lupus. My uh, uncle who lived across the street died of Parkinson's. I'm no different than anybody else. And we're a nation, you know, the last, uh, you know, I led the effort with uh, Henry Waxman and John McCain and Paul Wellstone back in the 90s to double the money for the NIH budget. And, you know, as I kick the tires and I go back to terrific uh, research institutions as at Michigan, uh, University of Michigan uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, there's just a, a crying for the, for the research dollars that they need. And we can, we can find the solution to these diseases if we invest, we had sequestration, we've got these budget woes, uh, and great credit to, to the leaders on both sides. And I'm glad Nancy Pelosi is going to be here tonight for the dinner with me. But we've seen good advances. This is the first real jump start uh, for the NIH. We do need to do more of that. And that's, you know, if, if we can solve it here, I mean, not only do we create the jobs, but we'll uh, impact the suffering uh, in a positive way of literally every every family around the globe. So it's... It's, uh, that's what public health is. We need to find the cures for these things. Thanks very much. Tom? You know, if you talk to public health people and say, what's the definition of public health? Uh, the, the answer comes back, it's about assuring the conditions under which people can be healthy. So it is about changing the environment for all of us that makes us less likely to get sick. Uh, but really, public health as a field grew up in the 1800s when we had these epidemics of cholera and yellow fever and other infectious diseases that instilled panic in people. And there was this real public demand for, for a public health response. Uh, that was successful. Uh, those epidemics have not occurred, uh, or they're, they've subsided tremendously. Yes, we still have uh, problems with infectious diseases, but the biggest killers today are chronic diseases. Uh, they're cardiovascular disease and cancer. Because they develop over a long period of time, people don't panic about those in the same way that they did about infectious diseases. So it's taken us a more, it's more, been more difficult to get the kind of public interest in public health for these conditions as it has for infectious diseases. Nonetheless, we are succeeding. Uh, we are winning, uh, and I can talk more about it later if you want, um, against, uh, in, in, in preventing cancer, preventing cardiovascular disease. Uh, so I think it's a particularly important time for us to uh, force the focus of public health approaches on those diseases because we know it can work from our successes in infectious diseases. Well, it's a number of, of different perspectives here, and we're going to get into a lot of the themes and issues that, that you've raised over the, uh, the rest of this session. Uh, I wanted to start by, by uh, asking some questions about the role of government. In, in public health, because I think we do have some different perspectives here. When, when you think about the big public health problems we face in the 21st century, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, among many others, many of the prevention efforts focus on changing behavior. And there are many ways to go about that. And given the composition of, of, of the panel, I want to focus uh, a bit on heart disease here and, and the role government uh, should play, if any, in, in promoting public health. So, so Tom, I, I want to start with you on this. Um, in New York City, you work to use policy to change behavior, banning indoor smoking, menu labeling, uh, trying to limit the size of, of sodas. And I, I want to ask you, you know, is this an appropriate role for government, making it harder for people to be unhealthy? Um, isn't it in some way their choice to be unhealthy? Well, you know, I certainly believe in personal choice, and people will always make the choices that they want to make. Uh, the question is, as a society, do we, we do have influence over the, the context, over the world that we live in every day. And do, as a society, want to make uh, that system so that it promotes the sort of things that are going to kill people, or so whether it promotes the sort of things that will help people be healthy? Uh, and I believe the latter, uh, no surprise. Uh, and so, and, but the potential payoff for that is huge. Uh, so just to give you the, the numbers here, in, in uh, New York City, when my predecessor, Tom Frieden, came in as health commissioner, smoking rates had been 21.5% for a decade. Um, there were three major things he did to try to change the context for smoking. Uh, raising cigarette taxes, uh, making bars and restaurants uh, smoke-free, which was a radical idea at the time. Now it's normal, but it was a radical idea at the time and running um, counter-advertisements on television to change the, the people's perception of the risks of smoking. With those changes, uh, smoking rates are now down to 14%. That's 400,000 fewer smokers in New York City alone. 
Uh, that alone will probably save tens of thousands of lives, uh, more than you could ever do with a, a you know, hospital-based intervention. Uh, so just changing the context has, has a huge potential. Um, and people can still choose to smoke or not if they want uh, in New York City. Uh, so I believe there's great potential for government to play a very positive role in ways that extend our lives, make us healthier, and reduce health care costs. So I am uh, very enthusiastic about the role of government in, in promoting public health. You know, I just, I just might say, I, I've been in the Congress a, a number of years. I can remember, as I fly back and forth to Michigan, I can remember you could smoke on the airplane. Right. Just had to sit in the, in the back, I think. And it's, uh, uh, you know, we, we ended that. That was a, a somewhat of a controversial vote back in the, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember I provided the swing vote in our committee on banning smoking in the workplace. Again, that was pretty controversial. I had a uh, the lead Republican then was uh, from a tobacco state. He was not very happy with me uh, as I was the, the deciding vote on that. But now it is commonplace, uh, as it should be. And uh, I think it has a very positive impact on, on folks. And, you know, my wife was a smoker we got married and she quit she reminds me she quit on her own which is a good thing um, but you know she just you know for for years when you go to a restaurant and they're smoking my my daughter was a waitress as many of us uh, started in that field as we were in college and, and you know that was our, our summer job i mean you, you don't want smokers uh, there so it was the government does have a role to play and i very positive thing that we wouldn't think maybe twice about can you imagine someone Lighting up today on an airplane? Holy cow. You know, it's interesting. Now, yeah, Nancy? I was going to say, it's interesting. I just flew in uh, late last night from the HIMSS meeting in Las Vegas. And to walk to any meeting room, you know, you have to walk through the casino area and with all of the smoke. And it really reminds you how much we have changed the social norms in most places, giving people a chance at a longer, healthier life. And government has a very important role in helping to change these policies. And as Tom said, individuals can make their own choices in certain places, but the tobacco use case should give us all, uh, you know, a great sense of accomplishment in terms of the lives that have been saved. Fred, let me let me push back a little bit. I mean, before smoking was banned, probably on, my on, wife. Hold on, on. Yeah. it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I would take it if it was hers. <laughs> <laughs> so bef before there were smoking bans on on airplanes, there were warning labels and information on on, on cigarette packs. And one of the areas that's uh, been proposed for for information for consumers is menu labeling. Um, giving consumers more information when they go to a restaurant on calories and, and content of food. This is an area where, where you've been, been a critic. Well, I support menu labeling. Let, let's put it that way. But when you uh, require, you know, what, you know, for example, uh, pizza. I, I talked to the chairman of Domino's Pizza last week. He's, it happened, Domino's is a Michigan-based company. They tell us that if, you know, you have between... Thin and crispy and deep dish and, you know, olives without pepperoni. I mean, blah, blah, blah. you can have as many, you can literally have millions of different scenarios on a, a single slice of pizza. To require a menu labeling with all of that, I think, is a little bit overreach. Uh, I think it's one thing to have, uh, you know, as you, as you look at menus, yeah, I, and I make choices when I go to a, you know, fast food restaurant or whatever, I, I might choose something different based on the, the number of calories uh, that are there. But to go by an individual slice when you've got that many, knowing that uh, if you did it online, and many, you know, a majority of actually pizza orders is, is actually done online, you don't need to put up that whole display board that has to change literally with, you know, literally millions of different uh, combinations. So it's um, uh, the House, we passed bipartisan legislation uh, to sort of... Uh, uh, send a, a notice to the FDA, and we're hoping that the Senate will take it up and uh, be a little bit more reasonable in, in terms of the actual menu labeling itself. You can imagine with ice cream scoops. I mean, it's a you, know, you got. Uh, I go into Kilwins is our big brand in Michigan. They've got probably 60 different kinds of ice cream, and, and you've got a lot of different combinations. Whether you have a, a sugar cone, or whether you have a regular cone, or a large cone, or you put sprinkles on it if you bring your kids in. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it, it can be a better done regulation than what FDA came out with. 
I think what, one of the things beyond what's been said around the role of government would be to help eliminate some of the barriers to public health. So for example, creating incentives for the private sector to go after public health in a way that they haven't been able to before. I think 21st Century Cures is a good example of that. It's bringing the regulatory framework into this century that can help us streamline and, and take advantage of, of the digital revolution that's occurring. I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in just one, one second. Nancy, what, what's the American Heart Association perspective on using policy to promote health? I mean, SALT is an area where the Heart Association has raised big concerns. We sure have. Should the government restrict or in some way regulate the amount of salt that's allowed in people's diets? You know, I have to come back on this menu labeling thing as well. You, we absolutely believe at the American Heart Association that government does play an important role. You know, if, if at the end of every single day, we exist to serve the people in this country. That's why the American Heart Association exists. We are funded largely by donors who expect us to advocate on their behalf. And so whether it is increased sodium in the food supply, whether it is, you know, availability of um, information so that the public can make important, informed decisions about their health. We think that these are this regulatory fl framework that Joe has described is very, very important. You know, salt is a critical issue. You know, the average American consumes 3,300 milligrams of sodium a day, raising their blood pressure. People, you know, if you look at 70, uh, over 75 percent of this people of people in this country have or will have elevated blood pressure in their life, leading to heart attacks, strokes, you know, um, heart failure, other kinds of terrible problems and we need to regulate the amount of uh, these ingredients and we need to inform the public and back Fred on the menu labeling I'm glad to hear you say you support menu labeling because what we see from the public and what we know from our surveying is the public wants to know and understand they want to understand what's in the food that they're eating they want to be able to make decisions and they cannot do that if there's not a framework that requires it yeah. Um, I, I want to to move on to a, a, another another topic relates somewhat to what what Joe raised, but we're going to get more into into 21st century cures in a, in a minute. Um, this has to do with with big data and availability of data now in the in the 21st century. And um, there's enormous amounts of data that are become becoming available. Everything from data on our genes and propensity for diseases starting at birth. Um, our choices as consumers, our movements throughout the day, our health behaviors, treatment decisions, and health status. And, and I want to dive in a little bit to what this may mean for, for public health. Um, you know, Tom, I'll, I'll start with you again on this. And um, in New York City, um, you were very data focused. How did you use data to, to work towards improving health in the community? You know, I view data, um, you know, I'm a doctor, and I'm trained in things like when you examine a patient, you do a history and physical, and you do laboratory tests. To me, when you're looking at population health, that's what data is about. It's really measuring the health of your population. It's measuring the problems that are causing people to get sick, and it's measuring whether what you did to try to help people f uh, avoid getting sick worked. Uh, and so we used whatever data sources we could. Uh, most of the data sources during my time were things that had been around, you know, telephone surveys on smoking rates um, and surveillance for diseases. But um, we uh, started to tap into electronic health records as, uh, as, we, as I was finishing up, where uh, there are now, I think, about three million patients who are going to physicians uh, that are using an electronic health record that was designed by the health department where that aggregate data is accessible to the health department in an anonymous way, so we don't see any names. But through that, we can measure, for example, the body mass index of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers in a real-time way. Uh, so we can see, well, geez, this change was made. Have we actually had an impact on obesity this quarter, uh, rather than waiting for five years to see if that worked? So I think the potential for that to um, have us understand much more quickly what things can help a population stay healthy is enormous. I, I, I couldn't be more excited than the avail availability of big data to improve our public health techniques. Joe, one of the things that, that I've read you, you, you speak about is something called conditional reimbursement and, and the idea of getting paid based on how well a, a, a treatment works. Um, and I think the, the promise of, of big data is being able to give you that granularity to see. What is Novartis doing in this area, and, and how do you see 
the availability of data and information changing your model? Yes, data and the availability of real world data is allowing us to do what at Novartis we believe is going to be important to improving the sustainability of healthcare systems. And that is to be able to shift from what we have called a transactional approach where we're selling a pill or selling the, you know, the number of medications to an outcomes-based approach where we're getting compensated based on the real world delivery of a benefit. So an example of this is we just launched a new heart failure drug called Entresto for chronic heart failure. We know in clinical trials that this reduces hospitalization by 20% and it reduces cardiovascular death by 20%. So if you, if you go to a payer and you say, we can help you lower your total cost of overall treatment of chronic heart failure by lowering the disease or lowering hospitalization, and we know how much hospitalization costs, then we would get compensated based on our ability to help you do that. And if we don't do it, then we don't get compensated. So data, having the data available, facilitates those kinds of agreements. One of the other things that, that I, I read about regarding heart patients is this idea of remote monitoring of, of heart patients. Can you, can you explain a little bit about how yes. that ties in? Yes, if you shift from a transaction to getting compensated on the outcome, then it's in our interest to understand and, and help the health system understand when that patient may be getting close to having an episode where they have to be hospitalized. We also know that for chronic heart failure patients, when they start to retain water and gain weight, that's the beginning of an episode that may require intervention. So right now we're looking at ways that we can work with tech companies, with pro healthcare providers, with payers to remotely monitor those patients. For example, a Bluetooth enabled scale in their, in their uh, bedroom would be a very easy way to ensure that that, that uh, payer or pr let's say the provider, the physician, has great access to that patient and understands at home when they may have an event and that could intervene and we could call them and say, are you continuing to take your medication? Are you feeling okay? So it's that kind of, of remote patient monitoring that can help deliver a positive patient outcome. And this is all about prevention or at least reducing the adverse events associated with the disease. Th that ought to have a, a big role to play because uh, as we've seen with devices, I was out in Silicon Valley not too long ago, and we sat down with the, the Google folks, and they've got a watch that's just about ready, and it's going to be able to tell you if you're within a week or two, perhaps, of a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, to give a little, you know, 23 and Me. I mean, that has been just an exciting uh, version where people can, you know, spit in a test tube, send it back, get a little analysis about their own genetic background, and maybe take the steps, the preventative steps, to delay the onset of diabetes or, or something else, uh, and, and makes them much more aware. So we are really on the cusp, I think, of doing much more in terms of what that patient or prospective patient uh, can do to prevent to some awful occurrence from coming on and mm -hmm. having a better lifestyle and let alone a lesser cost in terms of their own financial security. Yeah, yeah. I, might, I yeah. might just add to that. I think the role that technology companies play it really has changed the landscape for public health, both from the patient, the individual patient's point of view, as well as from the system's point of view. You know, the things that we have access to today and an individual has access to today really can help them change the way they're managing their disease. We did a study about two years ago actually with Kaiser Permanente looking at remote blood pressure monitoring with Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuffs and an ability for this interaction between the nurse practitioner and the patient on a daily basis. And these blood pressures drop. This is a published study in our journal Circulation. And you know we, we are continuing to look and to study at the American Heart Association the effects of the technology enabled solution for the patient. The other thing I will mention from a prevention point of view, and we care a lot about prevention in public 
public health. You know, there's a real craze, and, and I was delighted to see folks from Fitbit here today, from IBM and other places. They have such an important role in helping individuals feel that they can have ownership of their health and their data. And you know, our dream at the AHA is that there will be a platform where all of this integrates together. If I'm a person and I have a scale and a blood pressure cuff and oh, I have my Fitbit and all these other devices, I need a dashboard. You know, I don't need five you know, separate apps of where to go to get the information. I need a dashboard and then I need that to be seamlessly provided to my healthcare provider. And then you think about the promise for research. You know, imagine this information being able to be served up in a way that could provide scientists and researchers with elegant time sequence data for really building out deep phenotypes for precision medicine. It's a real win-win, and the technology companies will drive that. You're thinking, uh, Tom. Well, I just want to put in a note of caution to this. I've, I've heard technology people uh, with great enthusiasm about earlier detection of disease and how that's going to make things automatically so much better. Uh, but you know, an awful lot of people today, they know they have high cholesterol and they don't change their diets, and they, they know that they have high blood pressure, they're not taking their pills, uh, or they know they're overweight and they really can't control that. So early detection by itself is not necessarily going to solve a lot of our problems. Uh, sometimes people are living in conditions where they really can't change in ways that will help out. And so we have to think about, all right, how do we make that behavior change easier for them, rather than just assuming that that early detection is going to take care of it? I, I want to push on that a little bit and, 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 and ask about what ways data can be used to identify those barriers. So you, know, you have kids around the country now with, with Fitbits. Um, is there a way to look at that data to identify communities where it actually isn't possible to get out and, and get that physical exercise and, and use that data for a more population-based intervention? I, is that something that, that has potential? I, I think it has huge potential. And my understanding is that the, the Fitbits of the world aren't using that aggregate data. And I would love to have those companies really use that data in the aggregate to understand, OK, why the people in this neighborhood aren't exercising more, rather than why isn't this individual person exercising more? Because then that can give us a lot of information about how we uh, reduce barriers to, to physical activity. You know, Fred, um, Joe, Joe was, was, was mentioning the idea of, uh, about conditional re reimbursement, where where uh, companies are rewarded based on their ability to keep patients out of the hospital and, and, and such, and looking at quality uh, delivered. And one of the, the changes that's going on as more data is available is looking at rewarding healthcare providers, not for the number of patients they see, but on the quality of care. So we've delivered. tried to do that. I know where you're going. Um, <laughs> we've tried to do that. And in fact, the bill that we passed last year that the president signed into law, the SGRs, Sustainable Growth Rate Index Fund, which in essence, uh, you know, that's, that's the reimbursement for all of Medicare, is now going to be based on outcomes rather than just the, the number of patients. And, is that a good thing? Uh, it's a good thing. You know, we passed it, uh, I want to say it was like 91 to 8 in the, in the Senate, and we passed it with... I want to say pretty, uh, 386 votes in the House. And it's not only going to save money, but it's also going to save lives. And it has a whole different focus then on what the physician community, what the providers are going to be doing for the patients that they treat. And without it, we were faced, I want to say we had something like 17 stopgap measures where if we didn't act, the reimbursement rate for Medicare, those physicians that serve Medicare patients was going to drop as, as much as 30% overnight. And so you're going to take away the physician community from even treating those over 65, let alone access uh, to seniors for you know, what, what is really pretty routine. Uh, I, I want to, to shift and, and, and talk a little bit about the promise of cures, because you know, we're talking about uh, uh, 21st century cures a, 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 a bit today. And, and what I want to start with is the issue of, of affordability of, of these cures. And, and Joe, I want to, want to start with you and the, the example of Gleevec, uh, which is basically a, a miracle drug for patients with a particular type of, of leukemia. It turned uh, that disease, which had been uniformly fatal after several years, into a, a chronic disease. And when the drug came out in 2001, it, it, cost, it was priced at about $30,000 in the US. And, by some accounts, Novartis was able to recoup its development within a couple of years. Since then, the price has, has risen in the US to, it was $92,000 a year in 2012, 
and the revenue was over $4 billion. Um, I did a story a few years ago about a woman in, in Texas who was trying to decide whether to sell her house uh, or treat her cancer because her copay was, was so high. How do you determine, you know, as, as we move forward with 21st century cures and more diseases that are targeting smaller numbers of, of patients, how do you determine what is a justifi justifiable price for, for a drug? Uh, I mean, is it what the market can bear, or is there, is, is there something else to it? No, obviously, you know, pharmaceutical pricing is, is front and center in a lot of discussions today. And in the Gleevec example, which is a good one, when we launch a drug, we continue to research the drug, and we continue to find new indications for that drug beyond its initial indication, which is chronic myeloid leukemia. So there is still investment that goes in, and then there's, as we find new indications, there's more value that is driven by that. But the, the thing to remember in pharmaceutical pricing is you have to think about the right time period upon which to think. So for example, we invest in high-risk activity to discover and develop new drugs, new treatments. Our shareholders and people that att we attract capital, they're, they're, we need a period of exclusivity to recover the cost of that investment with a profit, but then think about what happens once that exclusivity ends. And Gleevec is a perfect example. On February 1st of this year, Gleevec went generic, and there was one entrant, and in six months there will be multiple generic entrants. So that same drug will be pennies a day for eternity for any patient that has chronic myeloid leukemia for the future of mankind. So when you think about that and the benefit that the pharmaceutical company brought, yes, there was a period of 13 years where we recovered the cost of that investment, but now for the next 100 years, whoever has chronic myeloid leukemia will have it for pennies a day. So that, well, you have to, I think you have to think about that because if you say we're not gonna create incentive for pharma companies or other uh, private industry to develop new drugs, you won't have any generics because there won't be any innovative drugs. No one will invest in 10 years and billions of dollars to develop a new drug uh, if there's not incentive. So it's a very complicated and, and, um, and, and, and important issue. Fred? Let me say, too, that, you know, we, we learned very quickly that the investment by venture capitalists in this country dropped by a magnitude of 50% in the last four or five years. And it dropped because, you know, they're, those are the folks that are looking to get the return on the dollar, and they were going overseas. They stopped doing it here. And we got to turn that around. And one of the things that our bill does and we worked very closely with Margaret Hamburg, then the FDA director, and uh, you know, the new director is going to be, I'm looking forward to, to ser serving with him. But Andy Van Eschenbach, who is, uh, may even be here, I can't, all these lights are. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, Andy, the former FDA, I mean, he literally spent days in one, one of my subcommittee rooms going page by page, uh, looking through our draft proposal, making suggestions of which I think we took them all, uh, to make sure that the gold standard is still there, that we're not going to be putting out uh, drugs or devices that, that don't meet the criteria that it should have. But at the end of the day, if we can get our bill signed into law, like I think that we can, we are going to shorten the time that it takes from A to Z to get that approved. And when you do that, not only do you reduce the cost and the time, but get to deliver the drug and device to the patient in a faster way, but guess what? That cost is going to come down too. So it is going to be rather dramatic what, what we've done as it impacts uh, patients' lives. You know, Fred, you know, this is an area that the, the public this year has been focusing in on a lot. Mark and Shkreli was the poster boy for, for price gouging yeah. after raising the price of a generic by 5,000%. Um, drugs like Gleevec cost two to three times as much in the U.S. as in many other countries. And the Affordable Care Act and Medicare legislation have done nothing to address drug costs. Why does Congress prohibit the government from negotiating drug price? Well, you know, um, there was actually a study. GAO did a study, um, and it said that, you know, this is the issue as it relates uh, to Medicare. Can you, can you allow uh, competition? And GAO did a report, actually, with John Dingle then was chairman of, of the committee, and uh, said that there would be no savings at all. So we're, 
we're not convinced that you're going to see a savings there if you allow them uh, to, to bid against each other. But, you know, our, our goal is, you know, let's, let's reduce the cost by sp uh, expediting the approval process because we know that that can, that can uh, put some downward pressure on those ultimate costs. And, you know, as we know with Hep C as an example, and, you know, we, we saw what, what, what the price is beginning to come down now. And it's uh, rather a, still a substantial difference between a, a kidney transplant, which is the old way, and, and actually curing uh, the disease. And knowing that uh, we're going to be getting the generics, got more companies now that are involved, that price is coming down. They're working uh, with Medicaid in a number of states. Michigan is, is one of my state, but other states as well, to really try to get uh, those prices down, and it's working. Uh, I, I want to shift gears and... and, and uh ask a little bit about, about partnerships. It's clearly one of the promises of, of public health um, is groups coming together with different backgrounds to accomplish similar, similar goals. Um, but, it, but it can be tricky. Uh, there was a lot in the news this past year about uh, soft drink companies sponsoring uh, institutions to, to, to show that really obesity was about lack of exercise. Um, Nancy, I, I want to ask you, how does the American Heart Association go about finding the most productive partnerships? And how do you negotiate those in a way so that the, the organization is not co-opted? Yeah. You know, what an important question. And we're very proud at the American Heart Association that we have, for decades, I think, been able to demonstrate um, a critical role of coming together in partnership, whether it's the AHA with other public health organizations or whether it's the AHA with companies. You know, there are easy ones that, um, that you know, people can look at that and say, oh, yes, that makes sense. You know, Macy's, proud sponsor of Go Red for Women, bringing fashion to the issue of women and heart disease. You know, there are also uh, partnerships and relationships where um, we have to look very carefully at the goals of the partnership and do they allow us to achieve our mission, um, can we, of course, at all times avoid any perceived or actual conflicts of interest? You know, we make sure at the AHA, for example, that any partnership that we have, whether it's in a local community, a hospital sponsoring a, you know, heart walk event, or whether it's a national sponsor, that the American Heart Association science our experts, our guidelines, and our communication strategies always, you know, are there at the end of the day. And so we carefully look for relationships that help us extend our reach, that help us achieve our mission. You know, we recently announced, speaking of Google, a, a, a wonderful partnership to um, find a cure for coronary heart disease. Google, AstraZeneca, and the American Heart Association, administered by the AHA, a $75 million uh, research enterprise to fund one team and one leader. That is an obvious thing. It helps us achieve our mission and our goals. At the end of the day, we are very transparent with every corporate relationship we have. They're published on our website. Our corporate relations policies are on our website. And we're very proud of the relationships we have that help us achieve our mission. Tom, at, at the governmental level, at the, at the city level, uh, how does it work for you forming partnerships to improve health in a city? I mean, partnerships are essential in public health. Um, in, no matter uh, how big our individual government agencies are, you know, we can't influence all of the things that have an impact on somebody's health. We need to work with other government agencies, with the private sector, various entities. Um, but we also need to be very careful that we are not uh, being unduly influenced. Um, so we need, I believe, in strict rules about you know, who you accept money from. Uh, I think AHA's got good examples for that. Uh, in my last job, I was working for a nonprofit. We had uh, rules in writing about what we would accept money from and, 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 and what not, particularly from companies that are making big profits from selling stuff which we know is really bad for you, tobacco companies being an example. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't be having conversations. Um, and and I, I believe that uh, we should always be having conversations, even with those companies that are um, uh, we, we would never accept money from we think are inappropriate uh, in the hopes that maybe in those conversations they'll uh, pick up some of our values um, and adjust a little bit. But and that means that there will always be conversations and conflict at the same time uh, that, uh, uh, well, I guess that, yeah, there's something, the conversations and conflict can happen at the same time. Uh, but I think that the strict rules are important because it is, um, all of us are always looking for funding. Even in the government, we're looking for external funding. And if we don't, uh, aren't explicit about that, we can uh, risk losing our mission. 
Can I might just also say on that exact point that partnerships don't always have to be about money, though. You know, there are important roles that organizations like the AHA play. You know, when, when Tom was in New York City and Tom, his predecessor, you know, in really pushing for change in the food supply, as an example. So, you know, I, I'm very proud of the work that the science volunteers and staff of the American Heart Association have done to help in partnership some food companies think of innovative ways to reduce sodium in the food supply. That's not a financial relationship, it's not even a corporate partnership, but it is a relationship where the expertise we have can help change something that can benefit the health of all Americans. I, I wanna uh, ask some questions about a, a public health problem that, that has also been in the news a lot and, and is of, of great concern to people in public health, and that's uh, antibiotic resistance. And microbial resistance. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. There's concern that we're rapidly approaching a time when some infections are are untreatable. When you look at the causes, they're 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 multiple. Uh, they they have to do with behavior people have and doctors have around antibiotics, antibiotic use uh, in in uh, in raising animals. Um, but there's also the issue of the lack of new antibiotics coming down the pipeline. And there aren't many that, that are, are on the way. And there, there are many reasons for this. Um, clearly, there's more money to be made in, in, in chronic diseases than there is from making antibiotics. Um, when I worked on this program at CDC, we wanted industry to make antibiotics, uh, new drugs, and we wanted no one to ever use them. Um, and that wasn't a very healthy business model. Um, <laughs> But with more and more mergers of, of drug companies, there's less R&D going on in, in this area. And Joe, I'll, I'll start with you. you know, what kind of incentives are needed to get industry to work on an area that doesn't necessarily make business sense? Look, it's a good point. I mean, I, I think the business model on antibiotics is broken only because of the behaviors that are, are right now um, uh, being exhibited, but at the same time, there are companies, um, and we're one of them, that are working on infectious disease and new antibiotics, partly because of the massive problem that's coming. I mean, this is a big, big issue. Um, some people believe that we are already beyond the point where there's going to be, um, you know, a significant issue. And so, when you think about the kind of um, I go back to orphan diseases and, and the way that we were able to address the same problem when there was not a lot of incentive to go after a disease with a, a very narrow patient population. There were um, incentives that were put in place for orphan diseases that enabled um, extension of intellectual property. It enabled you to um, partner and work with the right patient group. So I think there are definitely incentives that could be uh, generated, and right now we're, we're having discussions with um, the HHS, with, the, with um, other elements of the government, to try to ensure that, that this is an area that is, is addressed. Because I, I wouldn't say that there is not investment. There is investment right now in bringing new antibiotics uh, to market, partly because the pharmaceutical companies see that we've got a big problem. And there's a little bit right now trust that once we bring these new drugs, these new antibiotics to market, that we'll be re reimbursed for them. But at the same time, if there were more incentives created by the government or, or through, the regulation, through the regulators, um, there would be even more investment. And I think we're trying to enhance that a little bit in the bill that we did. We had a, we had a provision in there that it's gonna help. And again, it came directly from us listening uh, to, to folks uh, on the outside world posing that as a, as a real issue that we needed to deal with. So it's, it's part of what, we're, what, what we've done with HR6. Tom? C can I take the opportunity of this panel to put in a request then? And that is that when you think about those incentives, we don't forget tuberculosis, which is not a major problem in health in the United States right now, but it is an enormous global problem. And mm -hmm. it's really been decades since we've had you know, creative development of new anti-TB drugs, and, and at the global scale, uh, we could make contribute so much to health if we are uh, doing R&D on those drugs as well. Hey Fred, I, I want to push a little bit in terms of, of, of incentives. Joe mentioned the Orphan Drugs Act and that's ability to move things forward faster, but uh, I did a Twitter chat yesterday with the rare disease community that, that you were just meeting with, and uh, FDA was on that, and the National Organization of Rare Diseases, and 
Um, they quoted a, a statistic that 95% of rare diseases do not have a treatment or, right. or a cure. And so is the scale of incentive that's being provided for developing new anti-infectives just not enough to bring industry to the table? So we did some. I would have liked to have done more, but it was, I don't want to say it was as difficult as trying to balance uh, basketballs on top of each other, but uh, to make it, you know, we, we passed this bill 51 to nothing out of committee, um, and uh, we allowed for repurposing of new drugs. We have some incentives there for a little extra exclusivity. Um, you know, we'll see what the Senate does. I mean, I thought we had a, a very good bill that uh, Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray are working on a, a number of different things that we don't have in ours. We're looking forward to include where uh, the president is on the Cancer Moonshot in initiative, which very exciting. We want to include that as part of our bill. And at the end of the process, I'm hoping that we can take all of the good ideas and have them as one that the president can sign. And uh, particularly with the rare disease community, uh, they know this is, uh, we really did some, some good things for them that are going to allow taking some drugs off the shelf, Novartis or Pfizer or anybody else, and being allowed to repurpose those drugs and maybe find the cure or alleviate the, the suffering. Um, and one of those, many of the rare diseases that otherwise, they don't have the incentive because there aren't enough people that are going to use them. You know, when, when, I, when I read the 21st Century Cures bill, um, you know, it, it does incredible things in terms of trying to speed drugs to the marketplace. Um, but what it strikes me is that it's, it's a bill much more focused on, on treatment than on prevention. Why is it so much harder for Congress to support and fund prevention than it is treatment. Well, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as that. I mean, one of the things that we did, we recognized that the money for the NIH wasn't, wasn't going up. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty stable. Uh, that was, you know, you know it, was, it was strongly bipartisan, but we were able to get, uh, in essence, uh, $10 billion over the next five years for the NIH Innovation Fund, and we paid for it. And we worked with our universities so we don't make the decisions, but we allow, a, as Diana DeGette would say, a, a Denver University to work with the University of Michigan to work with, you know, the, and, and strengthen and streamline that institutional review board process. But, but just, to, just to push a little full disclosure, I used to work at the CDC. Uh, yeah. when, when I think about prevention, I think about population health and, and work of public health well, agencies. So, I think so of let's treatment look at the Zika vice, you know, the Zika yeah. or Ebola. I mean, particularly with these dollars that we're going to be providing to the NIH, I think we're going to be able to prevent some of those diseases that all of a sudden they're, they're at the very top of the list in terms of what we ought to be focused on. You know, Rich, I might yeah. just, on this issue of the CDC and prevention and the critical importance of funding prevention programs at places like the CDC, Million Hearts is a great example. You know, this received funding. Yeah. Um, Tom Frieden and his team have focused on ironing out the variance and hypertension treatment in this country because of algorithms, and you can see some great data that I think we as advocates need to use to continue to raise the argument for more money for prevention. So I, I want to give you each one, one last shot before, before we wrap, very, just very quick. And, and this, is, uh, this is to address the question of the promise of public health. You know, if you look at the statistics, um, according to, to CDC data, baby born in the U.S. is two and a half times as likely to die in the first year of life as one born in Japan or Finland. Our life expectancy is not what it is in similarly developed countries. Do you see public health over the next 20 years, over the next century, uh, uh, changing that, that picture? I do. I'm very optimistic, and it's because of the technology explosion that we are now seeing. With the data and deep sequencing of the human genome, we're able to now target disease like never before, and I think in the future, you're, you're going to look at a renaissance of innovation that's going to address some of the biggest public health issues in, that we have. Nancy? I completely agree with that. It doesn't take away the critical role of all of us focusing on communities at highest need and making sure that we are in there, on the ground, helping change the environments in those communities so all Americans have a chance for equal right to health. Real quick, absolutely. Uh, oh. <laughs> it says please wrap up. Yeah. I'm gonna... <laughs> it does. <laughs> We're already off the air. Already, you know, 
Yeah, he's used to this. They're into, you know, something else. All right, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm very optimistic. I think the potential is great, but I don't think that the greatest uh, advances are going to be through biomedical advances. I think they're going to be through public health approaches. And it's more about applying those, the knowledge we already have, that, you know, smoking, diet, physical activity, these are huge, and making those really be brought to scale. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, an interesting discussion. I think you're in store for a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.